Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Is it good to be in person again or not? <laughs> and of course, that is no disrespect to the five or six hundred people who are joining us online and from all around the world. Uh, my name is Laurie Anderson, and I'm the executive director of the SFU Vancouver campus. This beautiful room we are in is part of our School of Contemporary Arts. It's one of nine buildings that make up the downtown campus of Simon Fraser University. And all of it is on the unceded ancestral territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Slavers. And we're very pleased and honored to be here. I'd like to begin by also saying that it's a real privilege to have you here tonight for this very special edition of what we call the SFU Vancouver Speaker Series. Featuring none other than Dr. Ravir Ressa, who I believe, oh yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Timing is everything. And uh, just before, we we'll hear your course from Dr. Ressa uh, shortly, but just uh, before she received her Nobel Prize, SFU gave her an honorary doctorate degree, so it's really good to have you here at your alma mater. Thank you. 
encourage you to keep your masks on throughout the proceedings. And I hope you will all join us afterwards to have, where we have a reception, we will have a, a cash bar, snacks, and a chance to discuss what we what is going on today. Lastly, I'd like, to, I'd like to remind you of SFU's community guidelines, which were posted on the registration pages and will be reposted in the chat for the online audience. At SFU, we strive to uphold the highest standards of civility and mutual respect for everyone at all events. And this, of course, means there's no place for hate speech of any form at our events. And we thank you in advance for your cooperation. And now, to tell us a little bit more about where we are resident, please join me in welcoming SFU's President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Joy Johnson.
please welcome the CEO of the Owano Foundation, Lara O'Reilly.
Dr. Orff. <laughs> Um, it is, I, I got a good call from Lara. That's a lovely introduction, Lara, thank you. Um, basically, when she asked me, I said, you know, I didn't want to do anything this month, but the trick to getting people to do things that they don't really want to do is to offer them things they would crawl over broken glass <laughs> across the entire continent if necessary. And so I was like, yes, I will be there. What done it. And uh, here I am. Um, you, I've seen you the past couple of days, you have so much energy, so much optimism, and every time I see you in your smiling face and your demeanor, I think about the fact that there are systems and governance in the Philippines that we is, are trying to put you in jail for possibly 100 years, which is in, in your I know in your young years you would not survive much of that and try to shut you down in so many ways. How do you keep it together? Uh, hmm. I, I don't let it stop me from doing my job. You know this, Carol. It's so I think part of it is oh gosh, I I still believe, I still hope. For justice, uh, these cases shouldn't have been in, in court. But you know, when I was arrested, I was like, okay, we're in a new world. Uh, so I, I don't have a. I just do what I. I do my job. But you're human. You're human, and you write a lot in this wonderful book, which you all have to read. She read the galleries. How to stand up to a dictator, and believe me, this is a hard to book. And you talk about being vulnerable, and that vulnerability is something that we're all afraid to be, because when you, especially in public places, but yet you have decided that vul vulnerability is your asset. It's the very thing that, it's like an armor that protects you somehow. Like, how, how is that possible? I think that in order to really have a real connection, you have to drop your shields, right? And yet, I, I think when I was growing up, I just, I couldn't, like, I wondered why it was so hard to cut through. Right? We're kind of taught to have a, you know, to look tough, to be tough. Uh, but that wasn't really what I wanted to be as a reporter. Although, you read it, and, and you know, one of the first things my, my boss told me when he saw my stand up, you know, that piece of camera that you do, he, he said, um, uh, put a, you look 16, put a suit on, and then drink brandy to lower your voice. <laughs> so, so I did, I followed, I'm a good, I, I followed. And um, I got drunk before I finished what I was doing. <laughs> my voice is high. You know you are going to be Dr. Ressa one day, and you might have been more serious about it. I know, yeah. Uh, I, so I guess I felt like uh, the lesson I had in my whole life was that if, if so many people are afraid to drop their shields, what could be the worst thing that could happen? And and for me, it was like, okay, if I take the chance and drop my shields, I can have this incredible, so we have so little time, right? And that's, I always felt that, especially when we're interviewing, right? When we walk into a story, there's so little time, and you want to get a good interview. How do you get a good interview? You're either a really hard-hitting reporter, sorry about that, or, that's what I tried to do in my reporting, was to have more, to have a real connection. And then in my life, it became, you know, I, I could, I had great friendships. I had strangers I would meet who, if you drop your shields, what can they do? And they tell you things, don't they? They tell you lots of things. You learn. And at the same time as a reporter, oh my god, okay. Uh, and then, what's the downside? The downside is that they might slap you. And I always calculated it. I'm strong enough if you slap me. So the risk was always worth it. Vulnerability, I think, for women is, is, a, is, a, is a superpower. I think that's how we make connections. You, um, you spoke 
the title How to Stand Up to a Dictator. I, I would think, as I followed your career, it's how to get up the nose of a dictator. <laughs> I mean, you just, and, and I, I was trying to, what was good to do to see in the book was when you, I mean, there are many things that got up President Duterte's nose that you did. But, but the principle among them, I think, was the, and you're right, you, 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 you document this, is when Rappler, your online news agency, reported on the extrajudicial killings that were going on in the Philippines and who might be responsible for that. And that was, that got you, you got great stories. You, you talked to Duterte himself. He told you he did that. As I, he killed people. Yes. He did. The, but this was even before, so this was like before he decided to run for president. We sat down, um, and, and I remember the it's like, so this was October 2015, and he hadn't yet decided to run for president. And we just sat down, and he remembered the last time I sat with him, which was in 1989, when he was accused of extrajudicial killings in Davao City. And, uh, and I thought this man was. He was playing a game, but I thought he was going to run for president. So we were in Davao City, and I asked him, and he admitted on camera he killed three people. What do you do as a reporter? I think I just like okay, and then I and then I followed up again. He became very straightforward. He actually delivered every promise he made while he was campaigning. I am going to kill. I am going to kill so many that I will drop their bodies in Manila Bay and they will feed the fish. I mean, the estimates of people killed, uh, the Human Rights uh, Commission in the Philippines estimated up to 27,000 killed in its first three years in less than three years. So it wasn't blustered, it wasn't just hyperbole. He said he was going to do that. And this is, again, the beauty of your reporting style, this vulnerability that you get people to tell you things, which he obviously was willing to tell you, and you were able to get others to tell you, and you and the other, as others at Raptor, at Raptor were able to document this, and um, this really got up the nose of the dictator, didn't it? it? It counted and gave, and I guess, you know, when you're counting numbers, you can lose humanity in that. And so what we did was to do an impunity series. And every story was about a life of someone who was killed. Uh, yeah, but we weren't the only ones that pissed him off. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, and to go back to how you did that, and then, again, the beauty of the reporting style of you and the others at Raptor was that there were 27,000 people that were um, the society considered, well, these were just, just people that were troublemakers, these were drug dealers. But you put a face on each of those people. You gave them a name, you gave them an identity, you gave them yes. family. And, and, and that was such powerful journalism. I think that's what we do, right? And that series, um, that's what we spent time on. We put, uh, a dedicated team on that. And I didn't want them to be numbers because this was horrifying. I mean, if you think about it, right after, hours after President Duterte was sworn into office, the first killing happened. And we only had one team, because we're a small team. We're about 100 people in Rappler. That includes tech, you know? Um, and every night, this one team would come home and we would have eight dead bodies dumped on the sidewalk, you know. And so from, from July, August, September, until the end of 2016, we knew something horrific was happening. But by December, when we were trying to keep count, at the beginning, the police was actually keeping count themselves. And part of that was because they were getting credit for this. But at the same time, they realized that if they gave the real count, they would also get criticism from human rights groups. Uh, so they started changing the numbers in plain sight. So we, then, then it was a combination of giving faces to these numbers, and some of the most horrific ones are, you know, the five-year-old granddaughter of 
a guy, an older guy, who, who was just killed by the, the bullet, beat the casualties. Um, anyway, so as we were doing that, then we were also keeping track of the changing numbers. This is, you know, I called it death by a thousand cuts of our democracy, but it is also death by a thousand cuts of history. It is death by a thousand cuts of facts. Well, literally, yes. And that, and that, that was such powerful journalism. And then, it, and it, I mean, many things in between. Um, but the second time, I think you got up this other nostril pretty far, um, when you and the others reported on the troll army, the army of um, the, the online assault on democracy that you were able to document, thoroughly document, um, and to show that they were pushing out fake news stories as a team, hired to do so, manipulating the narrative, and lying to the public. And that was the other extremely powerful work you did that was then after which the state really went out personally. Both online and in the real world, right? Uh, we have the data. We have that evidence. I will tweet this, the very first series of the uh, propaganda war. We call it, it's the weaponization of social media. So the weaponization of social media, from the data, you say a lie a million times, it becomes a fact. You attack a journalist. Journalist equals criminal, right? You uh, say this a million times, and people believe it. It's a fake bandwagon effect. It's astroturfing, fake grass. But then, after you do that for a year, then that same narrative comes top down from President Duterte himself. And he says, you know, journalist equals criminal. And then a week later, we get our first subpoena. And, a, and that first, oh my gosh, maybe 14 investigations, uh, 20, by 2017, I was spending more time with lawyers than I was with raptors. Um, but I think the reason I was so certain and the reason we stood our ground on this, our, the second part, I wrote two of the three-part series. The second part was how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. It was probably the first time that that was questioned, connected to, this is information operations. I mean, I also run after Western media sometimes because they, they put misinformation and disinformation together. It's disinformation. It is insidious manipulation. It is information operations on us. So, uh, yeah, when that first came out, that was when I got pummeled. And I just pummeled online first, you know, at, uh, in every single part of the You were at one point getting as many as 90 threatening, horrific personal messages per hour. Yes, that, all I could do at that point, I, at, at the beginning, because I, I was the truest of true believers in social media. And that is the greatest irony. I believed we, part of Facebook's growth in the Philippines was powered by the fact that we at Rappler, when we were beginning, would go to colleges, to universities, to talk about social media for social good, social media for social change. I had hoped that technology could jumpstart development in countries like ours. And to see it, to see this frankness, to see it turned upside down this way, it was so painful. Um, but the 98 messages per hour, I, at the beginning I was trying to respond. Um, <laughs> and then I couldn't because there was just too much. So I just started counting. And, and I realized this is something new. What was new? What, 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 this is the first country because a lot of your book describes what you then started to pull away like a little thread in the sweater and it starts to unravel. What do you think you had identified at that point? I mean, it, you know, it's hate at exponential scale. Uh, something I now call behavior modification, right? It's free speech used to stifle free speech. You pound someone a million times, a target, until that person sinks. And so, and 
Joseph Conrad is the heart. What I realized when we finally got the data and I realized it, you know, I was afraid because my team, Rappler is a young team, you know, our median age is 23 years old. And so I worried about our reporters, our young reporter who was assigned to President Duterte. And you'll see there's a film, A Thousand Cuts, where you can see Duterte towering over in a press conference, trying to intimidate her. This is, you know, this is something we have never faced before. I mean, we face power, and um, when you're in the moment, you can ask the questions. In this one, there's silence. Because even if you speak, your credibility is overwhelmed. So it's like you pound a million times. I'm certain Filipinos believe I'm a criminal. Some, I hope, not too many. Um, so it, it's something we, it's stripping away the foundations of, of what made journalism, what made the public sphere. Even these ideas of free speech and, um, and what that means, it's stripped away. We have to redefine it. But the, the, what you were getting, and I don't want to go into the details of it because they're horrific, but it, it was it was the, the personal messages that attacking your credibility was a huge part of it. But the ugliness, the misogyny, the, 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 the really disgusting things you faced, which you thought you could respond to or ignore or whatever. You're a human. It, 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 at some place it must have. Um, at the beginning, yes. Uh, and I, I push this away, you know. Um, uh, at the beginning, it was shocking, and I didn't really believe it, especially because you're used to, if you're a good reporter, you're used to prints, right? And so here it is coming at you. Uh, and it was quantified much later, so. UNESCO actually went and got like uh, almost half a million social media attacks against me. And they, they said 60% of the attacks were meant to tear down my credibility. 40% were meant to tear down my spirit. And these are, you know, dehumanizing attacks. I, I have eczema, which is really dry skin, and they, they memify me. You <laughs> wake up to like really horrific photos. And it hits you, and but this is what a breaking news reporter learns to do. Whatever it is that hits you, because it's new, you push it down to the pit of your stomach. You think, <laughs> and uh, and for me it was thinking through what is this, why, and um, and it was you could actually do that. I don't think we have a choice. I don't. I mean, you know, if you've been attacked on social media, okay. There is a good part to being a target. And this is only the target actually sees the scope of the attacks. So what did I do? The way I dealt with it is the way I deal with really bad things. I work really hard. And we took the data and studied it and began to understand how information operations work. And as it changes, it's, it is a it is like an arms race. As as they see one thing, um, as they see a tactic lose force, if, a plat if the platform decides to kind of take them down, they switch tactics. Only the target sees that. So, I mean, the, I think that's what made it unique. I was the target, but I didn't let it take away my voice because since I was the target, I could see, quantify, and report. Right? And when I reported it, so here's the part that's not so um, hopeful. No one really likes data journalism. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't get distribution on social media is the other part, right? So at the beginning, we thought, oh my god, this is a fantastic story, right? This quantifies it. And you look at the numbers and you just go, no one reading it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, and the book is full of graphs and charts. It's really, I mean, when you can read it in a book, you can start to see the context. But I can see that trying to put that out in a, in a world where everybody wants 
fast news. But it was it is really important, and and you did it, but also, as you just mentioned, this UNESCO Global Study, so important, which showed which was, which actually deconstructed the attack on you, which must have helped you a lot to realize, okay, I can see the data, I can see how they're using it. But we also learned from that UNESCO study that there are three quarters of of women online are um, journalists. Women journalists are attacked. One fifth suffered personal attacks, like physical attacks, and they come from that. So we know that that, that that online business can translate into physical attacks. And it's not only is it demoralizing the online violence, but that it also, and this is, I know this is one of the things that Bolano Foundation is trying to reveal and trying to deal with. There's a row of women there, I met them, I saw them last night, just absolutely extraordinary, who are part of this initiative, initiative at Luana, and so is Maria Bavdaresa. And um, I've, we, now we're going to start seeing, being able to, but how did, how did you learn, how did you first learn that you were not alone in this phenomenon? Because I wasn't the only one being attacked. Um, my young reporters were being attacked, and I thought, you know, I have a track record, a long track record, and I have, I'm older, but my young reporters, I'm so worried about that, about them. And then the other part is that, how do you even talk about it? So what we did as a team, well, so two things is the online violence, that worried me, so we increased security. And then the second part is almost, if I was having difficulty dealing with it, I wanted to make sure that our team could talk about it. And so we went to look for counselors, counseling. But it was so new that, that our counselors needed to get training to be able to help us, right? So, so it took a little bit longer, but just talking about it was the first step. Um, but I guess, okay, so how did, it, I just knew it was new. And I felt like if we didn't expose it, so here's the other part. Even though not that many people read the first series, a lot more read it in the coming years. Mm -hmm. And if we had never done that series, which, you know, what happened was after we did that, my, my ex managing editor actually said, Maria, because I'm the CEO, I'm also the president, and I was also executive editor. We have a few people at Rattler. <laughs> so, so, so she was like, maybe you should stop doing those types of stories because when you get attacked, the whole, the whole company feels it. I wrote two of the three parts. And for a little while, I did stop doing those stories. I didn't stop doing the data part. But, um, but I did because the company felt it. Uh, but I realized that if we had never done that, then our country would have been less prepared. As it was, all of these things which seemed more, which didn't bring the numbers, in the end was still the right thing to do. So it goes back. The right thing to do is the right thing to do. As you were investigating and tracing where the source of this was, where this new thing that you felt, this is new. I have to find out what this is. And as you poked the thread on the sweater, realizing, okay, the troll farm that Duterte's office is running, it's coming from the state, it's coming from outside, it's coming from troll farms, other it's offshore um, sources of this, and you were getting that data, where you started to sit, to circle around, was this thing called Facebook. And you write in the book, I believe that Facebook represents one of the gravest threats to democracies around the world. How did you come to that conclusion? data, experience. You know, uh, I could go to jail for the rest of my life, and I haven't done anything differently than I have done as a journalist before Facebook. And that is where the vector of attacks happened, and they didn't pay attention. Uh, th did I say Rappler is a Facebook partner? <laughs> We're <laughs> frenemies. Um, <laughs> It's, it has become a behavior modification system. Because I think part of it is, if you're on Facebook, which I, I'm sure you are, uh, it, you, don't, you think about this as individual posts. 
but at scale, um, when they're able to get your personal thoughts, right? So as you put in your post post, they have machine learning coming in to take all the posts you have ever had and create a model of you, a clone of you. Right? These are your personal thoughts, your personal ideas, your, your personal friends. connections, your family, right? Uh, this is a clone of your life. And because they use machine learning to create it, they now own you. They take that. Then artificial intelligence comes in and scoops up all of our clones and then puts it up. This is the core problem. That is the database that they use to micro-target advertising. Uh, and what's happened is that what was used for advertising is now used for geopolitical power play. And that is a danger. So, you know, online violence is real-world violence, and impunity online is impunity offline. The reason... The reason why we have elected, elected, democratically elected more illiberal leaders is because our information ecosystem has been determined by the algorithmic choices of, in my country, Facebook. A hundred percent of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. For six years in a row, we spent the most time globally on social media. Globally, six years in a row. You know, so we're like the petri dish. <laughs> <laughs> but Facebook, it, that's not its intention. It's, it's amoral, right? It's, it, it's not trying to manipulate elections. It's trying to make money. All of this is about exploiting all of this for the purposes of commerce. It's not to try and influence things in order to have power. The power is the money. The money is the power, right? Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I ran you over with my car. I'm so sorry. It doesn't matter what their intent was. What matters is the impact and the harms. And, and look, I just not, it's not just Facebook. It is all of these technology companies that, that were ahead of all of us in understanding how the real world can be mirrored on, in data and then used it to uh, to keep us on the platforms and to get a license, to, no, they don't even need a license, to print money, right? This is, and, and I, I don't think I quote him in the book, but I use this all the time. E.O. Wilson is a, a biologist uh, who, he studies emergent behavior in ants, right? So there are three ways that this social media affects us, psychologically, personally, so here's our personal cycle. Our psychological makeup has changed. Uh, the second level is the sociological, how we behave in groups. We behave differently in groups than we do individually. And then the last part, which is the part that too little is written about, is emergent human behavior. Human behavior at scale. And what they have, what, what the platforms have done is to, E.O. Wilson's quote, um, that the greatest danger we face, the greatest crisis we face, is our Paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technology. The tech guys are not godlike in wisdom. You document how lies are so much more powerful and can take priority over facts and do so on Facebook. That's its greatest strength in this world of making money off of disinformation is how powerful lies are. And so what is what has that done to our professional journalism? Oh gosh. Well, first let me give you a study if you're interested in this. As early as 2018, MIT did a study that showed that lies spread at least six times more than those really boring facts. <laughs> um, and that connects to, what does that do for journalism? It commoditized journalism. Journalism, if it is degraded to just page views, means that we have to 
play by the incentive structure of the algorithms of distribution. So think clickbait, right? Or there's no incentive for our news organizations to spend a month on a really um, whole power to account investigative story because it's not going to get any distribution on the platform. So that, that's a, one of our biggest problems, right? When news organizations were the gatekeepers, we both created the journalism and we had the distribution system. When the tech companies took over the distribution system, they turned our incentive structure upside down and I would argue turned our values upside down. Um, so what, what kind of journalism was, was given the widest distribution? Oh, the ones that lie. And then the ones that are laced with anger and hate. So it's not journalism, it's propaganda. And so we see journalism degraded, even as the journalists come under greater attack. So here we are trying to do our best to hold power to account while our reach has been diminished. And um, the dangers to us have increased. And reputations and spirit being undermined. That's why you have to be Mr. Spock. <laughs> yeah. But then, uh, yeah, but you gotta laugh, because it's a crazy thing, right? <laughs> there may be people for whom it doesn't matter. There's, there's, journalism is, it, it is taking a lot of knocks um, these years, and so maybe people think, well, okay, what does it matter? There's, they've had too much power anyways. But what does it do to democracy? What is this? erosion of truth, of, of facts. What, what effect does that have on what we value most in this country and in many countries in the world that have it? It's democracy. Nothing is possible. Nothing is possible if you have no shared reality. Right? So, and facts form our shared reality. Uh, and I've said this three sentences in numerous ways over the last seven years or so. If you have no facts, you have no truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without any of these three, you, we don't have a shared reality. How can we begin to solve the existential problems that we already have? Climate, coronavirus, the battle for facts, right? Those, to me, are our, our biggest challenges. If we don't have a shared reality, how can we even talk to each other? And so, like, I've gotten to a point of when I keep trying to explain this in ways that capture your attention, I, I, I get it down to, you know, think matrix, like we're the human batteries for this huge thing, but so we're, we're giving our energy to power this, i.e. our data, and, and yet, at the same time, we're not really connecting with each other because what we are doing is we're creating 3.2 billion Truman shows. Right? How do you find meaning in your life? Anyway, sorry. Oh, no, you're not. This is exactly what you read. But you talked, you, you and I have talked about this about 2024 as being a watershed moment in your view where um, this erosion of these institutions, the erosion of democracy, the, the discrediting of facts and truth, that we're headed to a, a real a, a, a cliff at that point. And um, where authoritarian, illiberal governments are going to have their field day. The last chapter's title is Why Fascism is Winning. And I use that word very sparingly, and the person who really tipped me over to, to call it fascism was Madeleine Albright. You know, she, we had a long talk about this. You know, she talked about fascism as uh, plucking the, the feathers from a chicken one by one. You know, I, I talk about death by a thousand cuts. You know, a thousand cuts, this comes from counter terrorism. Al Qaeda used asymmetrical warfare against the West, right? It was death by a thousand cuts. Well, death of democracy by a thousand cuts. Like, for each cut that you have, we're bleeding. And you get so weak that you die. 2024, we talked about this. I enjoyed my conversations with you. Know, so thank you for putting us together. But in, in 20, by 2024, we will have elected enough illiberal leaders democratically so we democratically elect them 
they take power and then they crush the institutions from within. And you know, I take a look at the Philippines. So this year, the Philippines had our presidential elections on May 9th, ex almost exactly 36 years after Filipinos ousted Ferdinand Marcos in the People Power Revolt, we overwhelmingly elected Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Uh, for president. And he just like the government now is thinking about getting rid of the, the government agency that's running after the Marcos wealth. Wow, surprise, right? Um, there are more than 30 elections this year. Kenya just had elections. We had like huge discussions about this. Uh, Brazil, October 2 is, is, is its elections, and it has a second runoff October 30th. Uh, next year, you have, oh yeah, that US elections, midterm yeah, November, yeah. right? Next year, you have uh, Nigeria, Turkey, other African nations. 2024, that's the red letter year. We have Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim population, where the front runner today is the son-in-law of former President Suharto. I covered the end of his 32 years in power. Uh, India will have its elections, the world's largest democracy. The United States will choose a president. If nothing changes in the trends we're seeing, if nothing is done with our information ecosystem, that will be the year where there are enough illiberal leaders so that autocracy ain't proven and a whole loss, right? Okay, and you trace this back to the effect that these tech platforms are having on eroding and undermining the values of democracy, right? And insidiously manipulating our minds. My question to you is, if you're on these platforms, uh, how do you know that you still have agency. How do you know that the choice you're making for your leader is yours, right? And and I can show you the data that shows it's not. <laughs> she can, honestly. <laughs> but okay, here's the thing, though. Um, we have seen this before. We've been in this movie before. We saw. I'll just give a few examples. We saw what the Nazis were capable of doing. We saw what Hitler and Goebbels could do with propaganda, with newsreels and rallies, to, and Lenny Riefenstahl movies, to mobilize an entire nation, to, to in, go into a, a war that, that killed almost 100 million people and attempted to destroy an entire race of people. We've seen even more recently, we saw in Rwanda, the ability of using a radio, radio stations, radio programs, to in, within 100 days have Hutu power to kill, mobilize the population to kill the Tutsis. We've seen it over and over again. It doesn't always end in genocide and, and, and war and murder, but we've seen these authoritarian regimes come into power without the use of this time. I'm just wondering to what extent is there a frightening disposition within our societies right now to be led in this direction? Oh, that's so interesting. Um, Do more and more people want these kinds of governments? So I have, having covered a lot of these things, we, we both have done this, right? Uh, there is a nostalgia for the past, especially if the present is so difficult, it is challenging. Um, and that nostalgia for the past, I've seen cycles in Indonesia where there was a, cycle, a nostalgia for Suharto, you know. Um, in the Philippines, the nostalgia for Marcos is elected another Marcos. That's partly there, yes. But that's more like our wishful thinking because the times are rough, are tough here. But here I would say that information operations is deliberate and there is a nervous system all around the world where you think each country is different, but Russian disinformation that attacked the 2016 U.S. presidential elections, mm, they're connected to the Philippines. We found from, from the, the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee released about a thousand page report along with the data 
from their investigation. And what we, we took the data, we found a direct link to the Philippines. Not surprisingly, it was Russian disinformation, a Facebook page. Uh, it was called Daily Century, and it was later taken down by Facebook, but that was the Facebook page that in 2018 had attacked Rattler and other news organizations the most. This is like the breadcrumbs are there. Uh, the geopolitical power play is, um, is shifting, is using information warfare against us. And sorry, but I, I, didn't, I get too geeky in the book, but Carol tells me it's not that boring. I <laughs> find it interesting. Um, but is it possible then that what um, the, the tech companies, the platforms are doing is to play into the very thing that works so well, but with this, this disposition, this desire to product people mm -hmm. to have answers. simple solutions, simple answers, um, that, that, that the QAnon can connect all kinds of dots and make life so much easier. If you, if, and so is it possible that tech companies are doing is that by providing these simple answers to complex things, they lure us and people into this world where, yeah, we want someone just to tell us, be godlike and tell us what to do. I'm going to separate those two things to what the tech companies are responsible for and what um, digital authoritarians are responsible for, or politicians who take advantage of those systems. I think the social media platforms manipulate our emotions. They spark fear, anger, hate. That's the kind of content that gets the widest distribution. They will. They may not admit it that bluntly, but the data shows it. And fear, anger, hate. Um, that changes us. You know, I, the example I use is, you know, the individual battle for integrity and that old cartoon where you have a devil and an angel and you have to make a really tough decision and you have an angel that tells you, no, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Then you have the devil saying, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, right? Uh, what social media did is it gagged the angel and then flicked it off your shoulder. <laughs> and, and then it gave, it made the devil like 10 foot tall and gave a direct line to your nervous system. That's what it's doing to each of us and that is creating emergent behavior, right? Okay, so that's one. The second one is, you know, what are governments doing to take advantage of this, of this system that has already been created? Because you're right, they only want you to keep scrolling. They want to keep you on site so that they can make more money. So they will exploit our biology, which by the way, you know, there isn't an upside to that. They've proven that all of us are more alive than we think because they use the same system to manipulate us. So they use our biology to keep us rolling. Here comes Russia in 2014. And this, this was cut out of the book, right? But it's in the footnotes. I stuck it in the footnotes. Um, in 2014, the details of this, right? The, I don't know if you were on Twitter during this time period, but uh, in, in, in May of 2014, the foreign minister of Russia actually was addressing the Human Rights Council in, in Brussels and or Geneva. And he he started giving a narrative. It was a bit the same narrative of um, Nazification. Uh, it was a justification for why Russia would come in and annex Crimea. Except that what he said was identical to what an account had written a day before. Uh, a doctor, supposedly, Dr. Igor, I can't remember his last name, or Slavsky, or something like that, and it had been translated into multiple languages. Uh, and it was about how the doctor was being prevented from treating people. It was, again, like this Nazification um, story. All of that, these accounts were taken down, but it was identical. So I, it's a footnote in the book. <laughs> um, it's not a footnote in history. It's not a footnote. But now we're, we're, we're living through this now, now, right? I mean, Russia used the same meta narrative to invade Ukraine itself. So um, I guess I'm just saying that uh, the geopolitical power 
as now ex is exploiting the weaknesses of something that was originally meant to connect us. And so for these companies to say, we need to connect you and completely ignore all of the warnings they were getting, because Ukraine had sent the warnings, we went to them with it in 2016, to ignore this and to watch the degradation of, of society. The, the death of democracy. Now, one thing that you do in your life and your writing is, we're all terrified now, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what, you just want to just crawl in the hole and see the end of it, but what really it does um, is to look for solutions to this. And um, she doesn't, everything that you, you gain you, you spend your political capital every time you get, you get it and you, you use it. You got the, the Nobel Peace Prize, and now you and a group of others in Oslo have developed an idea for how we might get ourselves out of this mess before that eight seconds to good night thing in 2024. Can you talk, talk a bit about that? Yes, so Shoshana Zuboff wrote a 750-page book. I can give you a summary of it. <laughs> it's called, this is where she coined the business model that now rules our lives, surveillance capitalism. And uh, in the beginning of September, uh, 11 Nobel laureates, and Dimitri was, had just, uh, so Mikhail Gorbachev had just died, and Dimitri and I were presenting this plan. Uh, you go to the core, which is stop, surveillance for profit. And then, yes! <laughs> and we broke it down into 10 points. I will tweet it right after we get off here. Um, but you can also go to the Nobel Peace Center. It's their front page. It's also in Rambler. But it's, so, so, so the goal, the key here is we have to stop fighting amongst ourselves. The good guys tend to fight amongst themselves. And then, you know, while the bad guys have already, like, systematized how to manipulate us. <laughs> so, um, we need to, we need to scale these things. And we need to stop wasting time on things that don't matter. Like, content moderation is not the problem. It's a combination, it's part of the problem, but it isn't, it's like if you're trying to stop pollution in a river, you want to stop the factory that's polluting the river, not analyze the water and take out a small portion of it, right? You, what you want to do here is it's data privacy, it's user safety, it is antitrust, and yes, content moderation, those are the laws that need to be put in place there. So that, that's one, one way. But the other way is we really need to experiment with what civil society, what civic action means in the age of exponential propaganda, in the age of behavior modification system, when we are losing our agency. So that's one of the things that we tried to do in the Philippines. And, and it worked. A whole of society approach in the battle for facts. We called it hashtag facts first BH. I said it was um, the Avengers Assemble moment. <laughs> this is it. I mean, you know, look at look at Europe. Look at look at Canada. Sure. <laughs> look at the United States. This is a global problem. So what we did at Facts First BH is we did a four-layer pyramid with law at the top. And the lawyers who were then part of this, there were more than 250 groups that, that take, took part in this. We only did it for three months, so it wasn't enough. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. began his campaign in 2014. It's, it's asymmetrical. Because we know that the, the, the foundation of democracy is the rule of law. Yes. And so if then you've got something lying, sitting on top of it, it's international, it has, it's not governed by any laws at all, then what is the point of individual countries like Canada having democracy when we have, so, so what, how do you establish the international law that has to be put in place to govern how these tech companies operate while still allowing for the free speech that you and I cherish? 
In the Nobel lecture I talked about, I compared this, the technology platforms, the technology companies to an atom bomb that exploded in our information ecosystem. And just like in war after World War II, when the atom bomb exploded, the world galvanized because, because it could see the damage. This one is a silent atom bomb. And it was so much harder to galvanize. Well, but this is what we need to do. We need to do exactly what happened post-World War II. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was created. The UN was created. NATO was created during that time period. These global bodies now are slightly outdated to deal with the global problems that we face. Because if we don't fix the information ecosystem, there's no way we're going to be able to fix climate change. You know, it, it, it's the core of everything that holds us together. That's the real core, not connecting each other. <laughs> we're connected in the real world, right? So, so, so for me, what we're doing in a lot of Foundation. This is the first time I've been with a room full of women who are, I mean, look, they're pretty cool. Timnit the Brew, who actually, like, exposed what was happening. Sophia Novo, who actually, like, uh, yeah, those algorithms of oppression. Um, there's uh, people who, women who had dealt with, who, who found the courage to deal with this kind of pylon. If you've been attacked on social media, you know what I mean. I worry about our kids on social media and the way they form their identities and and how they find meaning. Because this is our next generation. So um, this is what we need the world to do. Uh, and th this is what I've been trying to do the last two years, I think, is you know, we, the EU has been ahead of the United States. Canada is now working. I've testified for your parliament a few times. Uh, the EU is ahead. They passed the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And that will have an impact on all of us. So all it takes is one. Um, the US is very late. Uh, and it's ironic because these are American companies that, are, that have been used to tear down democracy. I just want to talk about Canada for a bit because um, one of the things maybe people don't know here is that these attacks on women journalists are rampant in this country. And um, it is, if you follow what these women are writing and the pushback they're trying to give and the lack of support they have both from our media agencies and from levels of government that they have appealed to, police they have appealed to, they have to, they have, they have to go to the police in some cases for protection. But they are going through exactly what these women from around the world are talking about that's going on. And just on Canada, just maybe you can give us some advice. Um, we had something that happened here on the weekend, which was that we had a new leader of the official opposition, Pierre Polyev. And one of the many things he's proclaimed he will do should he become prime minister, and there's a very good chance of that. He said that he will get rid of, pass laws immediately to get rid of the gatekeepers. And he doesn't define who the gatekeepers are exactly, but he has included the media and journalists in the list of gatekeepers that he thinks need to be curtailed. What would you say, what advice would you give us to explain or to deal with what possibly that means. You asked me this earlier and I didn't define it. What do journalists do? Journalists are trained to be the connective tissue, but what we do that requires courage is to hold power to account. Please don't call us influencers. <laughs> without Without the group that is holding power to account, then you get impunity, right? Then you have this corrosion. Um, this is how institutions die. So, I mean, but how do you do that when it's being, when the credibility of that profession is undermined? Both, it, journalism did a lot of damage to itself in these past years, 
but that it's constantly being questioned and undermined and told that you're you're telling lies, you're not yeah. telling the truth. Yeah. How, how do you how do you how do you how do you have that ability to be play that role when you're fighting a very right action of that kind? I think two answers to here. And, and we hear when journalists get together, when news heads get together. This is like one of the key problems. How do we restore trust? As if it's within our power to do so, right? In many ways, news organizations now are like, we don't have power, not in the same way. So this is the reason why I go to tech, right? Curtail that, put the guardrails in place, you know. Um, CRISPR technology in, in genetics, uh, Western nations automatically put guardrails in place on CRISPR technology. We can customize a baby nowadays, right? But, but you can't because you don't have the wisdom of gods. Um, so the laws are in place. I think this creeping thing, uh, the reason why journalism has been degraded is because in many ways, we also looked away from the power of tech. The tech platforms eroded trust. We come under attack. I haven't done anything differently than I did in 1986 or 1995 in the fall, or 1998 during the fall of Sparto. Right? Like I have, I. It's like the world moved right, but I've stayed. And this is where I get to hold the line. But the other part of that is that you are the ones being manipulated. And journalists fall into a trap because the the news, the tech companies have taken away, have killed the business model of journalism, which is advertising. It's dead. It's moved to micro-targeting, which is so different from the old advertising. Micro-targeting is more efficient because it has your clone. And so you pay for that. News organizations lose money to actually, we were just talking about how, you know, we worked at a time when we had the resources. We could go to do the stories, we could spend the money. I could spend $10,000 on one story, and at that point, CNN didn't blink, you know? I mean, in like two days. Well, so it's, so, so. News organizations, no, the business model is dying, they don't have the ability to do things, plus the incentive structure of distribution is towards crap. You know, it, it, it will distribute clickbait over really good journalism. And then the other part is that you're being manipulated. You, let me talk about the United States, because this is data. Um, data proves this. In the United States, no one has ever been held responsible for for splitting the fracture lines of society wide open. It is identity that is targeted in um, Black Lives Matter. Russian disinformation, the IRA and the GRU, both targeted both sides, pro and against. And they didn't care because they weren't trying to make you believe in something. They were just trying to make you doubt everything. And fight. And hate. So the journalism as an uphill battle. I think we're still doing this. I, I, but if you, if you don't step up, we can't do this alone for very long. What do you face when you go back to the Philippines? Hmm. Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> Stay here, we need you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, let me give you the good news first, right? This year alone, um, we had almost 50, 50, 60 counts of cyber libel that were, that were filed at the prosecutor's office. That meant we needed to have legal time. Uh, cyber libel is a criminal offense, which means if it passes the prosecutor's office and, and you are arraigned, you can be arrested. And so we, we had to plan, right? there were some, some, some of these went to like different people in different cities, different people in Raptor in different cities. So we had to give bail money just in case they get arrested. And they like doing things like arresting you on a Friday at 5 p.m. so that you can't post bail until Monday, right? So you stay in jail. Um, so all these charges were thrown out. So that's the good news. Uh, I still have seven criminal charges, the, the cyber libel case. You know, this is a story I didn't write, edit, or subvert.
compromise uh, at a time, published at a time when the law we supposedly violated didn't even exist. So we're supposed to be that prescient, you know. Um, so this one has already moved to the, um, the Court of Appeals. We had appealed it to the Court of Appeals and they denied it. So we filed a motion for reconsideration. And uh, the next step is the Supreme Court. So my, my timeline before I actually have to go to jail is much shorter. And it could be quick. Um, and then there are the tax evasion charges. There are five of them. Um, tax evasion charges are funny, they're creative. Um, they decided that Rappler was not a news organization, or, and this is a direct quote, a dealer in securities, like a stock brokerage. And so we didn't pay the, the tax for a stock brokerage house. Yeah, because we're not a stock brokerage. Um, <laughs> this one will be a decision before the end of the year. So what do I face when I go back? Uh, yeah, I could go to jail. I mean, there's, there are infinite threats. I try not to think about them, but I try to be prepared. I mean, you pack, you always have a little bag with you in case you, I just, I always wept when I read the part that you actually pack a little pillowcase in there to see if it. You don't know. You don't know what'll happen. It, when you prepare for the worst case scenarios, and it doesn't happen, it's a little bit of a relief. This is the best, I mean, I, you know, I didn't go to jail today, today, honey. I, I, I came home for dinner. I mean, that's most of us are terrified of getting a traffic violation in the face of these kinds of things. I mean, do you, why do you go back? You, a lot of people who face the situation that you do just stay out of that country. Why? Why? Why not? A lot is at risk here, right? Uh, I, I'm not a single reporter. I run a company. And uh, we're holding the line. Um, we're, you know, we watched uh, the, our history change in front of our eyes. Uh, and it, it's, there's this Milan Kundera quote that I love. Uh, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. Social media can make you forget quickly, right? And so, um, why do I go back? I don't think I have a choice. I have to go back. Uh, not going back is a betrayal, not only of rappers, but also, <clears throat> it's like a baton is passed to you. I became a news head at a time when the baton was passed me at a very bad time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not gonna drop it, right? Uh, and I'm going to hand it off to the next news head. Um, I'm not willing to be the tipping point the other way. And I'm not willing, it, this is kind of like, it's, I believe in this. I believe a lot.
from zero. And we could not have survived without our community. So this is why I believe in the goodness of people. And you have to jump in, because we're, we're plugging the hole, but it, it could come crashing down. <laughs> I'm going to ask um, Andrea Crossan to give us closing remarks. I'll just tell you a bit about Andrea Crossan. Oh, you're lurking over there. Um, Andrea is executive editor of something called Global Reporting Center, um, and it's one of tonight's events, Swaps with people uh, obviously know. Um, the Global Reporting Center is an independent and nonprofit media organization dedicated to innovative journalism. We sure need it. And, um, and we're glad to have that organization as part of UBC. And they're doing some really, really important work right now and the same kind of investigations about what's happening online. Um, Andy, which is also known, Andreas Andy, <laughs> recently returned to Vancouver after two decades as a journalist in London and Boston. And uh, she has worked for BBC, CBC, Associated Press, NBC News, and I want you to give a warm welcome.
listeners. See you there. Good night. Thank you, everybody.